Welcome to the podcast, Dan. Thanks, Peter. Great, uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Okay, so let's get started by giving the listeners a little bit of background about yourself. Why don't you just tell us um, tell us a little bit about what you, what you've done and uh, and what you do today at Garnet? Sure. So uh, I'm Dan Arlotta. I'm senior vice president at Garnet Capital. Uh, often tell people, look at us as Garnet, no capital. We don't buy anything. Although <laughs> you know, sometimes uh, it's a good way to get somebody to appear for a meeting. Uh, we're a loan sale advisor celebrating 20 years now and involved in the sale of performing, non-performing, and charged off assets across really all product types. Uh, roughly 30 people headquartered in Westchester County, New York, with offices around the country from Tahoe to Minneapolis, Boston, Atlanta, and Houston. Um, despite... Um, you know, I would say have have really no other acts to grind other than maximizing price terms, um, mitigating risk, protecting brand reputation for the sellers we work with, while putting together a deal in story uh, in a you know, transparent, fair process that allows buyers to easily digest and trust what they're buying. Um, we work with some of the largest banks, credit unions, government agencies, and obviously fintechs in creating and, and building markets for product that doesn't trade every day. Nobody's hiring us to sell Fannie Mae eligible mortgages. <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're the ones that are, uh, you know, doing horse trailer loans, RV Marines, student loans, personal loans, auto, uh, again, a lot in the, the fintech space, but, um, you know, a wide array of products where you really need to, um, come up with the story, understand the product, find the right people, and um, you know, get the deals done. I'm a part of the sales team here, uh, covering banks, credit unions, specialty finance, debt buyers. You really have to be a generalist first, um, although m much of the work that I do here involves honing in on, on the fintech space. Um, been here 11 years now, which you know often joke feels like yesterday in 50 years. At the same time, um, you know, my, my first sales job, I always say, was, was selling pens and pencils that I was collecting from my parents' house in first grade. Great business, by the way, 100% profit margin, <laughs> um, but, but short-lived. Um, you know, uh, fast forward a little bit more uh, prior through, you know, a series of internships. I uh, was heading toward more of a fixed income sales and trading path uh, until the company that was hiring me out of college uh, went under halfway through my final year. Um, so, you know, welcome to finance, right? right. Um, big believer, though, and things happen for a reason and, you know, persistence, good habits, things work out. Garnet gave me a, a shot and, you know, here we are. So uh, it's a great place. I uh, get to speak with smart people every day, work on short, medium, long-term projects, but every day is a new day, um, and that keeps me from getting bored and uh, you know, keeps me excited. Right, right. And it has been an interesting last 11 years, to say the least. So before we get into it, um, maybe let's take a step back. Um, what What is the state of, of loan buying today? Um, obviously particularly interested in the fintech space, but maybe you could give us sure. a sense of um, the overall space as well. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I think I'll maybe do a little bit of a look back the last couple of years, you know, maybe since 2020. Um, uh, and maybe even before that, you know, I think the fintech space arose, uh, you know, following the, the Great Recession, a little bit more benign in environment, uh, rates, you know, going down or, you know, flat. Um, which was great because it allowed for growth, you know, of the, the new, new industry. Um, I think that looking back in 2014 was, I was sent for kind of a recon mission out to San Francisco at, at, at LendIt at mm -hmm. your conference. Um, and, you know, it was a, a more entrepreneurial space, um, than I think where it is today. That's, you know, a little bit more focused on, 
you know, ha how the efficiencies should work and, you know, uh, a little more fine tuned. Um, you know, you look at, at 2020 and, you know, especially following COVID, call it latter half of the year, um, things really started to take off, right? Perform borrower performance was great. At really all ends of the performance spectrum, um, you know, all the way down to charged off where people were getting uh, their stimulus checks and, you know, making payments on things that they hadn't, frankly, in, in years. Um, it was a market where if we brought a deal, if you brought it, they would come, right? Mm. And saw a lot of deals where if price talk was X to Y, um, everybody would be at least in X to Y. And then you would have through some combination of, you know, what I call maybe second place syndrome um, or just needing a deal. Um, you know, you had, you had a lot of outliers, right. And um, you know, that, that remained, I would say through the end of certainly 2021, a little bit into 22. Um, I think at that point, right. You had inflation, uh, starting to pick up, uh, subsequent rate rises would follow, uh, less on, you know, the, the stimulus, uh, packages and, you know, really, really changed things. I would say a little bit throughout 2022, you know, you started to see less of the outliers, a little bit softer market conditions to where I would say the end of 2022 through end of Q1 2023 was probably the biggest shift I've seen in the market since I've been here. Mm -hmm. um, I would, you know, obviously some of it, you had banks having issues last year, you know, that, that doesn't help. Uh, you have cost of capital going up, you know, from the lenders to the lenders, the lenders to buyers, kind of the entire, the entire stack there. Um, you also had rates starting to go up. Um, and, you know, when, when that happens, it was really the first time since I've been here that seasoned portfolios that already existed, right, were uh, from a rate perspective underwater relative to new originations, mm -hmm. right? And, and what does that usually mean? That, that means uh, discounts. And I would say for most of last year, certainly the first half, maybe through Q3. And again, especially on the performing side, um, you know, FinTech being included in this, you had some real uh, bid ask spread challenges, right? I think that the market shifted towards more of a buyer's market. Sellers spend some time getting used to that, um, you know, wanting pricing more of old. Uh, but, but throughout the year, kind of understanding where the market was to where more deals could could get done. Uh, I think there were a lot of deals, especially in the consumer space last year, floating around. Um, I, I, I get the gut feeling that, you know, two in 10 actually were, were getting done. So for us, you know, we really had to pick spots and, you know, opportunity costs became much more, um, you know, uh, paramount. Um, I would say as we enter this year and where things stand, there's liquidity in the space, which is, is great. Um, I think that it's, you know, liquidity at, at what price and relative to what other opportunities may be out there. Um, you know, I remember May of 2016, right? There was a bit of a hiccup in, in the FinTech space um, pretty, pretty early on uh, in, in, in the days there that had an effect of, of more tourist investors, right? right? So we saw between 2016 and 2019, we were pretty busy in, in selling secondary pools for investors that, you know, came in for a year or two, moved out, called it a day, um, you know, maybe, maybe shifted strategies. But as I see it today, uh, there seems to be less of that. I think that the, the FinTech space is, is more ingrained um, in the market and, you know, seems to have more long-term viability than them. Uh, so net net, you know, I think the investors in the space uh, have grown and are, are um, you know, more stable, right? To realize that there's going to be some ebbs and flows. Um, 
you know, I think uh, a lot of the market is still dealing with, call it the late 21, early 22 vintages. Um, you know, the performance on those uh, haven't been as strong. Uh, but, you know, again, as, as it seems like a, a mo moment in time uh, where as, as that starts to season its way out and curves flatten, new underwriting with higher rates comes through. Um, you know, I think, I think the platforms have been smart about that over you know, the last year, year and a half and, you know, adapting um, to where people are, are committed. Um, on the secondary side and sort of, you know, our space, um, I would say people are always looking at is, you know, what can I get on the secondary side of season pool versus what I'm buying directly from the platform? And um, there seems to be some more interest, I would say, in the secondary side as of late. Uh, I think some of that has to do with you can look at a pool that already exists, uh, likely already have similar vintage product uh, in one's book. And you know, offers an opportunity to, I would say, to shorten one's duration if, if that's something that you know, somebody's looking to do. Um, and you know, pick up some more product along the way. So net net, um, people have liquidity. Uh, we're seeing more deals in the space. It's you know, uh, it seems to be. We saw a wave in between 2016, 2019, a little bit less over you know the 2019, 22 period. Uh, and things have sort of been picking up, I would say, latter half of last year into this year, where it feels like as far as fintech product in the market, um, you know, call it third or fourth inning sort of feelings around that. Right. That's what I was wondering about, because, you know, you talked about 2014 when uh, when you went out to our San Francisco event. And then that followed. 2015 was like a go-go year where everyone just got funded. Yeah. Everyone was just money was just sloshing around all over the place. Um, but, um, you know, whereas now- that was 2021. You, yeah, you know, so again. 20, right, right, exactly. So, yeah. Revisited. But then now, um, I'm just curious about the, the, the state of the market today, and particularly the, in, I'm interested in the, you know, because there's now lots of banks, like back in 2014, 2015, personal loans were pretty much all done in the fintech space for the most part. Now, lots of banks uh, are doing personal loans and a lot of them are just holding on their balance sheet. They're not doing a whole a bunch of sales. But I'm curious about when you're talking to buyers, um, is there much of a difference between a, a fintech pool of loans than a non-fintech, like a, a traditional financial institution doing a pool? No, I don't think so. I think, you know, you see a lot of three and, you know, three, four, five year term loans, right, of, of similar balance. I think, um, you know, the only difference, I would say, you know, banks, credit unions, they're going to focus a little bit uh, more on the higher credit. Um, so you see incremental, maybe higher FICOs as a whole. Um, they're also going to have more stringent floors on, you know, types of credit that that they will originate to. Um, but you're right. I mean, for the most part, uh, those originations in the non-fintech community have have largely been just, you know, held on balance sheet. Uh, you know, I think that there's there's a reason though why you know the, the fintechs exist and still exist that you know banks on the commercial side. Right, doing a hundred thousand dollar loan or a five million dollar loan is kind of the same effort. Um, and you know, when you're looking at at more volume, maybe versus the the balances, it's still something that I think is is tougher for them compared to you know the the, the fintechs. Um, so, you know, I remember back 2014, 15. Right, I mean, there's you know panels on. Uh, banks and fintechs, you know, partner or or build oneself. Um, you know, also uh, things like cost of borrower acquisition, right? I mean, that's the advantage that a lot of banks have um, that they can tap into their existing base um, versus you know actually acquiring a, a customer, which you know can be expensive. You know, some of those same things still 
and I think same questions still exist out there, um, you know, with incremental progress along the way. Right. Yeah. Okay. So then, um, uh, like now with um, interest rates have, have been high, like they seem to have stabilized, um, at least for now, uh, with most people thinking the next movement is down. Um, but are we with with that obviously higher borrowing costs? Um, you know that have been, you know, with people have been used to low interest rates for a long time, and and um, you know now looking at you know probably interest rates double what they were. Um, you know, when when you're doing a, a say a personal loan, for example, from uh, two two and a half years ago, are we seeing an increase in activity in the in the non performing loans? What what are you seeing out there? Yeah, and I mean you're right. Uh, there's some of the same deals, you know, selling today that were uh, six to eight percent, you know, or twelve to fourteen percent now, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's it's a real shift um, on the NPL side. Definitely seeing an uptick um, in that. Uh, I think some of it is related to growth along the way, although, you know, it'll be interesting to see the next six months or so of what kind of comes from, call it the 2023 type origination product. I think, you know, what we're seeing a lot of now is, you know, an uptick related still to that late 21, 22, which was just before. Right, uh, I think inflation and the rate rises kick in. Um, you also had last year, right? I think two unknowns in the market. You had rate rise after rate rise, and you know, n not really an end in sight. I think it's a positive that, you know, one can make an argument: does it go lower? Uh, does it stay where it is for longer? Um, but you could at least form a market, I think, around that now. Um, you know, that's, that's a box that people are now used to. Borrower uncertainty and performance, you know, I think still remains. Um, although it seems like most people talk to, um, you know, I don't know if it's a combination of, of, of hope uh, as well as, um, you know, a a actual prediction, but uh, it's, it seems like they're looking towards Q1, Q2 this year of maybe the end of a cycle and some uptick in, in NPLs. Um, we're definitely seeing more though. And, um, you know, feels like that'll continue at least for the first half of the year. Uh, and then, you know, we'll sort of see what the newer underwriting of 2023 at higher rates coupled with, you know, what, what the Fed does, um, you know, after that. Well, the end plus a lot of the fintech lenders that I've been speaking to, a lot of them decreased their origination volume. We've seen it with the public companies as well, um, but even the, the private ones decreased originations, tightened the credit box, made a much more, um, you know, skewed it to a much more credit worthy borrower. Um, how's that sort of absolutely going to going to skew kind of what's in the market when it comes to secondary loan transactions? Well, you know, like I was saying, right, I mean, if rates do go down all of a sudden, uh, you know, some of these originations the last 12 to 18 months, right, then become very, very attractive as it goes the other way. Right. Um, I, you know, I think that uh, really throughout 2023, the platforms did a, a, you know, took a lot of time and focus on, um, you know, not necessarily focused on growth, right, which is inherently sort of embedded in, in you know, being a tech company. Um, but but focusing on, um, you know, sort of maximizing efficiency and, you know, getting 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 it right, um, which I think I think they've done a, a, a great job on. And, um, you know, there's always a lag in, in our business of when you start to see the effects of that. Um, but I have a feeling that, um, you know, in, in the coming mon months and throughout the year, um, that's that's going to be a. a show itself in a, in a very positive way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then when you're doing these secondary transactions, who are the typical buyers here? I mean, are we, are we talking primarily hedge funds? I mean, what, what, who are you actually um, working with? Yeah. So, so the buyers of the product and, you know, I'll do a little bit of, of separating, I think between uh, commercial and consumer, um, you know, consumer first, though, uh, most of the time, right, it's, it's somebody that already 
is is buying from the underlying platforms product right that 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 we're selling um that makes help makes it a little bit more commoditized i think that your yield hurdles can be um you know a bit lower compared to just the totally new product totally new platform type secondary sale um for the most part though it's 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 fintech focused funds um and that ranges from you know small to large um as well as you know your mid to large multi strat uh credit funds um you know it depends on the deal size right not everybody's going to look at a two and a half million dollar pool um you know trying to come up with some some new ideas and ways to right now to you know make sure that we have full market participation um and not have you know various people not be able to show um sometimes you know you'll get some some banks involved um as well uh less so on the say credit union side really because of you know credit unions needing to memberize borrowers mm-hmm. um but you know for the most part i kind of look at it as uh across all the platforms in the consumer space you know i look at it as a group of about 50 potential buyers you know it's one of the nice things uh here at garnet that i think is unique i get to talk to lenders you know the the originating platforms the buyers across all of them so you know you can really um listen to all of them and and find out where the successes are where the challenges are and um every time we take a deal out you know thinking about what's what's the optimal optimal way to do this um but you know figure funds uh fintech focused and not um a little bit on the bank side uh less so on the credit union side when we're doing the secondaries right right okay okay so can you can you share on the on the the platform side or the or the lender side who can you name some names like who who you're working with today Sure. Um so you know more broadly um we Garnet's been around 20 plus years, right? Um we've worked with I would say most of your top 25 banks. Uh you know, think Capital One, TD, Key on the credit union side. Um you know, we've worked with Navy Federal um on the fintech side. you know really the first sale that that kicked this all off um you know with with Garnet in the fintech space and in a lot of ways my career uh was 2017 uh lending club which was uh the wind down of of LCA yeah. um LCA you know, advisors and yeah. Cor- correct yeah and you know that offers up obviously when you have a bigger deal like that uh offers up the opportunity to create some domino effect and and go from there um so you know what i'll 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 say is um you know we've we've worked with on the consumer side you know the likes of lending club um we've worked with uh avant um you know we've sold product of prosper upstart uh upgrade marlet um so you know think some of the larger ones there um you know I've also done some some smaller sales for smaller um lenders especially those looking to get you know warehouse facilities and kind of get get going um but you know hopefully that gives uh, a little bit of a flavor i know um you know you had mentioned uh, you saw we had worked with figure um mm-hmm. you know there's a lot of different product types out there you know you try to start with some of the larger ones create that domino effect um i think since 2017 we've we've done 40 transactions in the fintech space you know roughly 2 billion of um purchase price there and some of that has also uh found its way into charge off forward flow sales um which is another one that you know more and more are um are looking to sell than work it themselves yep Yeah. So I I do want to dig into figure a little bit because I think it's an interesting case and I I I saw I think I think you even had a quote in one of the press releases that I that I read where um cuz figure's different to all the others in so far as 
they have originated everything on the blockchain, um, on the, the Providence right. blockchain that, um, how, like, I'm, I'm curious about a secondary loan transaction was the, I mean, the process obviously was different, but, um, how, like, I'm, I'm curious about the, the buyer side of, of this and how they felt with doing something that was so different from what they used to. Yeah, so that that one's actually was more on the new origination side. So, you know, bringing forward flow buyers to okay. the platform was sort of the idea there, um, which, you know, I, I think when people hire us for that type of effort, they're looking less for us to, you know, bring in the hedge fund community and, you know, more of your bank and and uh, credit union uh, right. community. So, you know, that's that's what we were um, we were doing there. Um, you know, when I first saw the, the platform there, um, I remember walking out of the demo saying, wow, this is really cool. I see the mm -hmm. tech right, mm -hmm. um, here. And, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, you know, where's the, the tech in the FinTech, right? And, um, you know, they, they had something very, very unique there. And, um, you know, that's part of that sort of opportunity cost. Uh, that, that we go through, right? We want to go out there with something that's unique and is going to get people excited. Um, you know, they were doing something that most do in, you know, 45 to 60 days um, in, you know, no less, uh, no more than five business days. Um, you know, doing it a different way. Um, but, you know, uh, getting there and, you know, those are the, the types of things that are always the most exciting about the fintech space where, you know, I think it resonates. Oh, you know, I, I, I got a, you know, a, a mortgage refi or, you know, a, a HELOC and, you know, it was painful. It was difficult. And, you know, that I think is ultimately, you know, the, the, the fintech space, right. Is, is taking things that already exist making them far better, far more efficient, far quicker, um, as, as well as, um, you know, just the, the completely new idea there. So um, it was a little bit different product or, or process in that it was, you know, again, more of that new origination buyer. Um, and then, you know, depending on who it is, you know, you end up spending more time on, uh, you know, kind of memberization of borrowers and things like that than uh, the economics sometimes. But. Right. right. Okay. Okay. So um, what if, if, you know, that if you want to, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, let me, let me start back up. We can, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to have the editor to remove the last 10 seconds. So when you're, um, say you're a lender and you want to position yourself for a successful secondary transaction, so what are, what are some of the best practices that you would recommend lenders do to in order to get the best price they can possibly get on these transactions? Yeah, so I think you know data is is paramount, right? Um, you know I think that uh, fintechs uh, they've done things certain ways. A lot of times it's their first sale, right? So. Um, you know, it might think that, hey, here's the data file, just have people take a look. This is what we do. Um, you know, I think uh, performance history, data, transparency, um, you know, being upfront with what the goals are, and really just focus on kind of no surprises in general. I mean, that's, 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 that's the best way to start a process. Um, you know, we like to spend a lot of time upfront making sure that what we think uh, the market will bear a process in, in mind, you know, seems to be aligned with, with the client's goals. Um, so we try to do that at the beginning. So there's no surprises. And once you hit the button of going to market, you have the right buyers, you know, prospective bidders corralled. Um, again, there's no issues. People could put their, their best foot forward. You know, I look at it as, uh, you know, part of buyers' jobs are to find the deals that I don't find, right? Those are the deals they want to get in there, be the one in the room, you know, get the home run, grand slam type deal. Um, you know, for us, uh, you know, on one hand, we're looking to maximize price terms for the seller. That's who we're working for. Um, 
on the flip side, putting together a deal that has as much information in it. The analysts here do a great job finding, you know, the golden nuggets and really telling a story, um, you know, because people, people can do the math, right? But at some point too, you're gonna have a finger in the air, um, especially as you get further down in sort of that, that performance spectrum, you know, NPL charge off um, to really, you know, have somebody get excited and make that jump, um, right, for a deal. So data, transparency, um, upfront goals, you know, those, those are probably the most important thing. Right, right. Okay. Okay. So last question then, as you, mm -hmm. I'm curious, you know, we're, we're, we are recording this um, late February. Um, what's your outlook for the next 10 months? What, what do you think is going to be the state of the market for the rest of the year? Sure. So going back a little bit to what, you know, said earlier, I think um, there's, there's a moment in time thing going on here right now, right? Um, the, if you look at the investors in this space and, you know, maybe more of that fund community, more so than the bank that's, you know, just handling their own balance sheet. Um, you know, I think if you look back over the last 12 months, right, if you're an investor uh, within a fund, right, you're, you might say if you just compare what the last 12 months have produced to exactly today's relative value, um, you know, it, 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 it may not be overly, you know, exciting. However, um, that I believe is going to over the next six months with the higher rates, the tighter underwriting, um, that is going to look very different. Um, so, you know, we have been seeing, um, you know, some sales, of you know investor redemption um you know uh, uh, capital capital inflows a little bit tougher that already though seems to be sorting itself out and you know more um more coming into the space again um i would say i'd expect to see more first-time sellers of charge-off product um i think on both consumer and commercial, maybe more so on commercial, um, which really hasn't been much in the way of, uh, you know, secondary transactions uh, and on either the performing or non-performing side. And yet every article, you know, you can turn up, oh, you know, commercial and uh, cracks forming, all of that. Um, but you know, there really hasn't been much in the way of supply. So I expect to see more supply on the commercial side. Um, we've done some sales in the space. We did a sale for um, Funding Circle, um, you know, about a year, year and a half ago. And, um, you know, certain markets, certain niches, especially where, uh, you know, I look at that commercial FinTech C&I product, um, I know one thing I'm out there trying to talk to people about is because there's been such a lack of supply, which is the exact opposite of the consumer space, um, the buyer community is surprisingly robust and, you know, pricing still is kind of at all time highs, um, especially, you know, again, as, as you get to that NPL side where, you know, you have C&I buyers, you actually had CRE secured buyers jumping into the C&I space in a search for product, that still remains. Um, that to me is, is one of the bigger opportunities um, for holders of, of FinTech commercial um, to be very surprised at the pricing that they can get out there. Um, and, you know, for a lot of, of the FinTechs, I think, you know, they're, they're running this, um, you know, sale process or collection process on, on behalf of underlying investors and, um, you know, the, the, the money today versus three to five years could be very attractive there. Um, otherwise, though, I, I, you know, I would say there's ebbs and flows. Um, I actually feel like the, you know, the more recent challenges, um, the, the sale, you know, the, the, the wind is, is uh, shifting in, in the right direction. Um, there's probably more of a focus on profitability. And, you know, as you said, 
right? Scaling back originations, making sure doing, doing things right, um, then pure growth. And I think that'll continue. Um, I think that there's always these really niche players that start up that are very focused on a singular product where maybe they don't really have much in the way of, of competition. Those are really exciting to me. I think, you know, that's a very specific uh, problem they're trying to solve for. They can get a little bit more, um, you know, I, I think pricing power from it. And, you know, the, the, the road to profitability um, is, is, is a little bit, um, you know, quicker and more in sight. You know, I love, I love businesses to like point of sale products where, um, you know, a lot of times you talk about the, the cost of borrower acquisition and things like that. You know, they have the benefit of going to merchants and you know having them do the marketing for them right and um you know that that to me is 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 a space that i think will become more prominent as as well but um you know i think the deal activity will be busy in the first half of the year uh it's it's an election year so um you know it's, it could go either way but uh could also see how come october um you know maybe even you know september uh people get into a little bit more wait and see mode um so you know i think uh i know we're 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 focused more on the first half of the year for sure um but you know in the fintech space in in general i always say the world's not getting less digital right nice. um long time ago uh you know i think people wanted to talk to their banker right instead of the scary atm um and you know, I don't know the last time I walked through the next set of of glass doors, um, you know, at the bank. So uh, the world's not getting less digital. FinTech is is certainly here to stay. Um, you know, you deal with some ebbs and flows, which is, is and at the end of the day, it's it's still in early early innings uh, in the grand scheme of things. Um, wouldn't be shocked to see some consolidation. Um, as I think equity and, you know, debt is more difficult to find and more expensive. Um, so, you know, I, I do think it's a year though, where, where, uh, people have the opportunity to kind of separate themselves a little bit more. Um, while also, right. You, you root for the whole industry because it's new enough, right. You don't, you don't want to see, you know, anybody, anybody falter. So right. I'm optimistic. Um, you know, I'm in this for the long haul too. And, you know, at the end of the day, every deal we take out with any FinTech, you know, I, I go to bed at night, um, you know, really thinking about what's the best solution. How can this sale make a company more successful, more, you know, uh, have with the right partners um, and, you know, hope, hope to be a part of that in the future. Okay, we'll have to leave it there, Dan. Um, really great to hear your insights today. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Likewise. Thanks a lot, Peter. Okay, see ya.